What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So, we're gonna check out 20 minutes of WWE wrestlers punished for going off script. Now, we've seen this happen, especially in the Vince McMahon era. Vince was a uh, very strict on what he wanted to see on his show what he wanted said what he wanted done and uh even superstars that you would think not get punished for saying or doing something they would just to prove a point you know so we're gonna check out some of them instances where you know wrestlers got in trouble for saying or doing something and vince didn't like it or maybe um maybe investors or you know people that have money that invested money into the show maybe they addressed it to vince like hey I, we didn't like what we saw here y'all need to fix that or we're gonna pull out our money you know it, it you know there's more to just vince not liking it even though i think a lot of the situations was just his personal preference but it's also tv regulations what investors want to see on the show so we'll check this out appreciate all love and support let's get right into this one in the world of professional wrestling, staying on script is crucial for the overall narrative and the success of the show. Wrestlers are typically expected to follow the directions given to them by the writers. There have been circumstances where wrestlers go off script intentionally. You could ask me anything! You could have asked me about AEW! <gasps> Sometimes these incidents can lead to changes in the storyline or backstage conflicts between the wrestlers mm -hmm. and management, where they can face consequences such as fines, suspensions, and in the worst case, layouts. In 2008, a steel cage match between Batista and Chris Jericho turned into a story. Batista bladed during the bout, which was against WWE's policy at the time due to the company's shift towards PG rated content. Blading or intentionally cutting oneself to draw blood was a practice commonly used before the PG era. Mm -hmm. However, WWE had implemented stricter guidelines regarding intentional bleeding, and performers were prohibited from engaging in this practice without prior approval. Vince McMahon was furious over the incident and he was contemplating firing Batista, but in the end, he issued a $100,000 fine for the animal. So Vince is there. <laughs> And he's like, I could fire you, but yeah. that uh, would be too easy. Yeah. Tell him what he said. And he starts passing out fines. And uh, so my fine was uh, $100,000. <laughs> and he just literally sucked the life out of me by punishing me for doing that. It just it broke my heart. McMahon also fined everyone involved in the match. Jericho was only fined $5,000 by Damn. McMahon. And Vince leveled the same fines against road agent D. Malenko and referee Mike Kyoda. In addition to paying his own fine, Batista also paid the other fines. As man to man mm -hmm. gained so much respect for that day because you paid everybody's fine. I knew we weren't supposed to do it, but to me, I was just it just felt like the right thing to do. The click consisting of Kevin Ash, Scott Hall, and that's Joel crazy Waltman, when you think Joel about Michaels, it. Michaels, and Triple H like, was a prominent backstage group in the world wrestling I'm federation. Trying to get my mouse to work, but that's crazy when you think about it. Like it's Batista. He was at that time still one of the top talents in the company, and he find him all because he bladed in a situation which he felt like blood would have been needed in a steel cage match. But WWE had changed their their narrative and what they wanted on television. It was a PG product. And everyone involved in the match got fine, but he paid for it. Because, you know, Batista's a stand-up guy. And it's just, it just shows that didn't matter if you were a top star or not. He was definitely going to find you. Now, was he going to fire him? I doubt it. You know, that's why I say it's too easy. I know he wasn't going to fire him. It's Batista, bro. That would have been a wild firing to fire somebody for actually making the match that much better to give it that realism. And, and you know, it, it I'm pretty sure that was kind of one of the deciding factors for Batista. Like, ah, I may want to move around from here. Maybe, you know, check out other ventures. Because right now, it seems WWE is not going to be, you know, what it once was. Federation. Nation Hall's last contracted match for the WWF we all know about on this May 19, 1996 at Madison Square Garden. At the time, Triple H and Nash were heels, while Michaels and Hall were babyfaces. Michaels wrestled Nash in a steel cage match in which Michaels was the winner. Immediately after the match, Hall entered the ring and hugged Michaels. This was not seen as unusual in story, as both wrestlers were babyfaces. However, Triple H then entered the ring and hugged Hall, followed by Nash. The four wrestlers then embraced each other in what was a significant breaking of character. Wait a minute! Mm -hmm. You were a bad guy. I was a good guy. You were a good guy. 
Wait a minute! They hugged for several seconds as a farewell gesture mm -hmm. since Scott Hall and Kevin Ash were leaving WWF for WCW. This group hug between faces and heels was an unscripted moment, violating the traditional norms of wrestling where such yep. interactions were usually reserved for behind the scenes moments. The incident became even more notorious due to the fact it was filmed by fans. This unauthorized footage spread widely, both online and in wrestling magazines, bringing the curtain call to a much larger audience than it would have reached otherwise. Vince McMahon was upset by the breach of kayfabe and the potential impact on the company's image and storylines. That subject's still a little too sensitive for you, Vin Man. Because Scott Hall and Kevin Ash had already confirmed their departure for WCW and Sean Waltman was absent during the incident, they escaped punishment. Shawn mm -hmm. Michaels as the WWF champion and one of the promotion's top stars could not be punished effectively. As yep. a result, the punishment fell solely on Triple H. One of the consequences of the incident for Triple H was a change in his booking plans. He was originally scheduled to be in the finals so of the 1996 crazy. King of the Ring tournament, which typically comes with a significant push for the winner. His place in the finals was instead given to Stone mm -hmm. Cold Steve Austin. Triple H was also demoted from his position as a championship contender and was booked to wrestle against less experienced or lower tier performers for the next several months. On February 8, 2016, just all because they had one hug. Sorry about that, y'all. All because of that one hug, it changed the course of WWE. If they don't do that, we may not get Stone Cold in the position he ended up being. That's one hug changed the landscape essentially for WWE. It's one of those butterfly butterfly effect moment, moments in WWE. That's one of them. And back then, they they definitely wanted to keep kayfabe alive. I don't know. I mean, they try to now. They're trying to as more. But back then, it was a big thing to keep kayfabe alive. So I, I understood. And once again, Shawn Michaels wasn't about to get in trouble. Everybody else was gone. The only person that was going to take the fall for it was Triple H. During an episode of Monday Night Raw, the wrestling world was deeply moved by Daniel Bryan's emotional retirement speech. WWE's roster and other personnel stood on the stage celebrating Bryan's career, soaking him in applause and admiration as the show went to a close. When leaving to go to the back, Vince McMahon was on his way to go backstage, uh -huh. accompanied by his daughter Stephanie. Vince took the first steps to which Titus O'Neil grabbed him by the wrist, allegedly stating ladies first, in reference to Stephanie McMahon, doing this in a playful manner. The chairman didn't take kindly nope. to this. He quickly pushed O'Neil away, sharing a few words before McMahon continued walking up the ramp and subsequently suspended Titus O'Neil for yep. 90 days, though the suspension was later reduced to 60 days. This received a lot of bad publicity, yeah. with the suspension meaning that O'Neill would miss WrestleMania and an extra payday, with it also being a controversial decision due to it being Black History Month. It was my mistake. My punishment was served. Arn Anderson did comment on the incident involving Titus O'Neil. Titus grabbed the fence by the wrist as he was starting to exit, caught him off guard, and he almost fell down. And I think that embarrassed him. Mm -hmm. I think it bent his mind and made him look bad because he almost fell. And it pissed him off right away. Legends such as Batista spoke out. And that's that's literally what it was. It was because Vince felt some type of way. He looked he didn't look strong in that situation because Titus moved him aside, hey, ladies first, in a joking manner, whatever the case was. He got mad. He was about to fire him over that. He got mad. Vince doesn't like to look anything less than Vince McMahon. It's crazy when you really think about it, bro. Out in support of O'Neill, with him being a close friend, offering out his criticism towards McMahon for the decision. I think Titus got shot because he got shot. We got that's bullshit. That should have been a man-to-man -man conversation, not a suspension. Not being there we go, Vince. Yeah, which we all are because Vince is a very physical, playful guy. So it's not only did he. Him with the suspension and the fine, but he just double f***ed him by taking WrestleMania away from him. So, Juventud Guerrero yeah. was known for his high flying and daredevil style, which had made him popular in WCW. However, upon joining WWE in 2005, he didn't find the same level of success as he did in WCW. In an attempt to stand out and perhaps recapture the attention he once had, Juventud Guerrero began performing a series of risky and banned maneuvers. This included Jeez. moves like the 450 splash, which was not a regular part of WWE's in ring repertoire at the time and was considered too dangerous due to the risk of injury. One incident that stood out was during one of Juventud Guerrero's final matches in WWE, where he wrestled Paul London on SmackDown. During the final moments of that bout, Guerrero delivered a 450 splash oh maneuver that fractured God. Paul London's face. This incident ultimately led to consequences oh. for Guerrero. Following this match and the injury to Paul London, Juventud Guerrero's WWE tenure came to an end, as his release from the company soon followed. On an episode of WWE Raw in 2010, Randy Orton- Especially if you're doing moves that they're not really comfortable with you doing and could potentially cause injuries, they Nah, they, nope, you gotta go. 
Orton, Kofi Kingston and John Cena shared the ring for a three-way match to determine the number one contender for the WWE Championship. At the end of the match, Orton was supposed to win this bout with a punt kick, but mm -hmm. Kingston deviated from the script. Kingston didn't move away enough for Orton to give him the punt kick. Orton, yep. seeing the situation, decided to end the match with an RKO. Randy seemed noticeably irate, repeatedly yeah. screaming stupid at Kingston. Happy Kingston jaw in face! This yep. incident reportedly led to some real life tension between Orton and Kingston, with Orton expressing his frustration both in the ring and backstage. Before this match, Kingston was hot and he was on a mm -hmm. massive push. Unfortunately, this push came to an end. Kingston was sent back to the mid card. He, yep. quote, killed your push, the, the, the push to be in the main event. And, um, and that is what happened. WWE even had plans for Kofi Kingston to win the Money in the Bank That's ladder so match crazy, at WrestleMania 26, bro. but those plans were changed. In a six man tag team. That's crazy. I mean, he ended up getting his moment many years later, but just, ah, uh, that's how weird the wrestling business can be. It can be one simple thing that derail you or maybe even ruin your wrestling career within WWE. Wild. Team Dark match that took place during a SmackDown event in March 2018, Aiden English, Baron Corbin, and Rusev teamed up against the Usos and AJ Styles. During the match, the wrestlers engaged in a comedic spot where Aiden English took multiple super kicks from the Usos. While this happened, fans were chanting for the referee to intervene. AJ oh. then started taking the referee's shirt off. While this incident added some light-hearted entertainment to the Dark match, it reportedly drew the ire of WWE management, and the superstars got threatened with release and gigantic fines worth tens of thousands of dollars. Luckily, Damn. They were only fined, including the referee. According to the story, John Cena intervened and covered the fines for the wrestlers, recognizing the value in their antics. On the November 7, 2017. Shout out to John, bro. Shout out to that's that's once again John's a stand-up guy from what we know. And uh that's pretty awesome, man. That he did that. Episode of SmackDown Live, Sami Zayn faced Kofi Kingston in a singles match. Kingston ended up with a victory, and then Owens quickly entered the ring and attacked Kingston before both he and Sami abruptly exited the ring. Owens and Zayn definitely went off script here. This departure from the planned script left the New mm. Day confused, resulting in a different ending to the segment. The original plan was for the New Day to collectively beat down Owens and Zayn after Sami's loss. WWE management reportedly viewed Owens and Zayn's actions as unprofessional, leading to their removal for the remainder of the European tour as a form of discipline. Plenary reaction. Oh, damn. During the match on WWF's Jack program that. in 2001, Perry Saturn was facing off against jobber Mike Bell. During the match, Saturn snapped and started to deliver one of the mm -hmm. most vicious beatings ever. He legitimately this. attacked Mike Bell. Following the incident, WWF did not immediately terminate his contract. They opted to relegate him to less favorable storylines and gimmicks as a form of punishment. One mm -hmm. of the most infamous gimmicks given to Saturn was the Moppy storyline. In this angle, Saturn became infatuated with a mop and began carrying it around his companion. So fucking Make a decision. Wow. The mop or me, Perry? Which one? You're welcome. Despite his contributions and potential as a wrestler, Saturn's career in WWE never fully recovered from the incident with Bell. Eventually, oh. WWF did release Saturn from his contract, marking the end of his tenure with the company. Over the years, there have been numerous reports and allegations concerning- And this is one of those things where they will ruin your wrestling character before they fire you. They'll do everything they can to humiliate you on camera, to make you seem like a joke. And then they'll fire you because then your stock would have went completely down. Even if you go to another company, because the last thing a lot of people would have seen you is out here interacting with a fucking mop. Granted, I mean, my man who did go OD overboard with the whole beating legitimate, legitimately beating the crap out of the other wrestler. But still, that's how they do it. Well, at least that's how they would do it back then. JBL's behavior backstage in professional wrestling. These reports have ranged from instances of bullying and hazing to verbal and physical confrontations with other wrestlers. The incident involving the Blue Meanie at the yeah, 2005 you know ECW one. one Night Stand event is one such example. JBL drunkenly beat up the Blue Meanie following the 2005 One Night Stand event over some comments Meanie had made about JBL in a shoot interview. As punishment, WWE decided to have him lose to the Blue Meanie on SmackDown. While that's bad enough, JBL's real punishment came from Meanie's best friend Stevie Richards. During the match Richards came in and hit JBL with one yep. of the most devastating chair shots in the bah. history of professional Ooh. wrestling. Oh, man, I'll tell you what, JBL is busted open bad, man. Oof. 
A oh, stiff wow. chair shot. In the 2004 shot. season of WWE Tough Enough, contestant Daniel Pudic became involved in an unscripted situation with Kurt Angle. Uh -huh. Kurt Angle fractured the ribs of one of the finalists and subsequently challenged the rest of the contestants to step up. Daniel Pudic answered the call. Pudic had experience in mixed martial arts before his time in WWE. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the UFC guy, huh? Yes, sir. So in an unexpected turn of events, Angle was legitimately caught off guard and mm -hmm. found himself in a vulnerable position. Yeah. Pudic almost managed to make Angle tap out, which would have been a significant embarrassment for the Olympic gold medalist. Instead of engaging in traditional wrestling maneuvers, Puda attempted a submission hold known as the Kimura. Oh, that, yeah. This hold, if applied correctly, can be very painful and potentially cause injury. Fortunately, the referee quickly intervened and counted a pinfall on Puda, ending the match prematurely and preventing Angle from potentially sustaining serious injury. Mm -hmm. Daniel had my arm tight. If it would have lasted five more seconds, he would have broke my arm. After this incident, it was reported that Puda faced backstage repercussions mm -hmm. from WWE. During the 2005 Royal Rumble match in response to this tension, Benoit Guerrero and Holly reportedly delivered stiff shots to Oh Pudic. no, they were beating the living brakes out this nigga. They were beating the brakes out of him, bro. Like, oh, you want to do that to one of us, huh? Okay. Bet. Say less. That's literally what it was. So during their interactions in the ring. <laughs> Oh my. This was seen as a form of punishment or hazing, as the veteran wrestlers aimed to teach Puda a lesson about respecting the business and his fellow performers. On the 1st of August 2011, a Divas Battle Royal was taking place to determine so the number one contender era, for the Divas Championship. The Divas one era. of those participants was Gail Kim. Shortly after the match began, Kim eliminated herself from the contest by hastily sliding under the bottom rope. Kim later explained that WWE had instructed her to get eliminated from the match within the first minute. Obviously, this is not what WWE wanted. Mm -hmm. yeah. The plan spot was for another Divas to eliminate Kim. And Maurice was actually supposed to eliminate me, but she got injured. They just pulled her from the match. And so they trusted, uh, you know, me, Natty, Beth. On August 5th, Kim took to her Twitter account to announce her departure from WWE in the wake of the incident. However, she later revealed that WWE did not grant her release and instead insisted that she fulfill the remainder of her contract with the company. After all this, it was rumored that Kim had a desire to be fired from the company and that's why she eliminated herself on purpose. Mm. Later, she denied these rumors. One month later after this incident, she was removed from WWE.com and her contract expired. On January... Yeah, it is kind of weird. Like, obviously, you're supposed to get eliminated within the first minute, but you just roll out and walk out. Like, no one, like, people ain't going, like, hey, didn't she, did she just roll out the ring herself? That's kind of wild. On 30th, 2017, Braun Strowman and Kevin Owens were involved in a segment on Raw. During that segment, Braun Strowman wanted a chance to fight Owens for the Universal Championship. Unfortunately, Strowman used the wrong phrase to challenge Owens, referring to the match as a title shot instead of a title match. Because I want the title shot you promised me. Title shot is indeed a banned term in WWE, according to Mick Foley. Which is crazy that's even a thing. Granted, we don't, they don't deal with that no more, which is fucking awesome now. That's just stupid. It's, I mean, it's... Title shot, like, come on, bro. Why? Vince was just, he was very particular with the verbiage. Vince McMahon tore into Braun Strowman for the sip up the moment he stepped backstage. Mm -hmm. Another example of superstars mentioning banned phrases, the Revival found themselves in a difficult situation with the chairman after they mentioned the term professional wrestler on yep. WWE television. We didn't like that. We're not sports entertainers, we are professional exactly. wrestlers. Exactly. Professional wrestler is indeed mm -hmm. another band phrase in the WWE terminology. Ms. McMahon wasn't pleased and he punished them by turning them into yep. a comedy act by putting them in embarrassing segments on yep. live television and made them job to the other superstars. Ultimately, the Revival's frustrations with their portrayal in WWE contributed to their decision to request their release from the company, which was granted in April. I'm gonna be honest with you. I would love to see how they would do now. Because I do feel like they, I mean, they had a really, you know, solid run at the beginning of AEW. I, I feel like they've definitely been, they've cooled off. They've been misused <laughs> in AEW, in my personal opinion. I would love to see how they work now. They would be in, uh, they would be treated like a legit tag team, a wrestling tag team. Would love to see it maybe one day, but yeah. We just got to remember how they were in NXT. Fucking Fantastic.
April 2020. The June 11, 2007 episode of WWE Raw was the night when Vince McMahon staged a storyline where he planned to fake his death in a limousine explosion. I know what he, During this uh, segment, Vince talk McMahon here. walked past several WWE superstars in the backstage area. Paul London was seen smiling during McMahon's walk yeah. past. Vince always wants WWE superstars to project the right emotions during the segments, but Paul London learned this lesson the hard way. Mm. While London continued to compete for WWE for some time after this incident, and even held the tag team titles, his push had eventually diminished. Yep. He was released from the company in November 2008. On September 30th, 2013, Triple H and Stephanie made their way to the ring to call out the Rhodes family with whom they'd been embroiled with a feud at the time. Once in the ring, they proceeded to insult all three members of the Rhodes family. During that segment, Dusty Rhodes took matters into his own hands by seizing the microphone from Triple H and confronting him face to face. Mm. In a daring move, he then placed his hand his in Stephanie hand. McMahon's face. Yeah, Stephanie swiftly reacted yeah. by removing Dusty's hand. This immediate response from her further emphasized her displeasure with Dusty's actions. The incident resulted in repercussions for Rhodes, including a significant reduction in his on-screen role within the company. One of the main mm -hmm. matches on the undercard at WrestleMania... I remember watching that. He he put the hand like... Bitch, stop talking to me. This is between two men. You, you shut your ass up. That, that shit was actually kind of cold. Rest in peace, Dusty. I ain't gonna hold you. That was cold because no one did does that to the McMahon. Like, mm, stop talking. Fucking... Like, Dusty was that guy, man. He was that guy, man. Mania 22 was a singles match between Mickey James oh, we know and about this for the one, WWE yeah, Women's fellas. Championship. During we know match, about Mickey this James one. James and Trish Stratus experienced a misstep in the final moments, resulting in a botched ending to the bout. But prior to this, Mickey James yeah. made a provocative gesture towards the camera. McMahon was reportedly furious with James and ordered that the gesture be removed from future video releases. Mm -hmm. The decision to edit out the gesture incurred financial costs for McMahon. Ric Flair's poor match with Scott Steiner at Clash of Champions in 1991 has significant repercussions for Steiner's career, ultimate derailing Steiner's singles push. The match left Steiner questioning whether Flair intentionally made him look bad. Nearly a decade after his clash with Ric Flair, Scott Steiner's resentment towards Flair only intensified. In 2000, during his tenure in WCW, Steiner publicly berated Ric Flair on live television. So Ric Flair, there's never been a bigger ass kissing bastard in his business! <laughs> this incident highlighted the deep-seated animosity Steiner harbored towards Flair, which persisted and even escalated over the years. In that same promo, Scott Steiner inadvertently seemed to promote WCW's opposition, WWF. Oh, yeah. So when you walked down that aisle last week, people at home, all they did was grab their remote, turn on the channel, WWF. This unexpected turn mm -hmm. likely caught WCW off guard, prompting them to take swift action to address the situation. As a result, WCW acted quickly to punish Steiner for deviating from the script. Following his shoot promo, Scott Steiner faced consequences in the form of a two-week suspension. According to Rene Dupree, Ric Flair attempted to have Steiner fired over the incident. Mm -hmm. you and your bastard friends try to get me fired! However, Steiner ultimately received only a suspension without any loss of pay. During the early 1990s, WWF had a no blood policy, meaning that intentional blading or any other method of causing bleeding during matches was against company rules. Despite this policy, Ric Flair bladed during his match against mm -hmm. Randy Savage at WrestleMania 8. As a result of Flair's violation of the no blood policy, he faced significant fines from WWE management. WWF Brawl for All was a shoot fighting tournament in 1998, and it was conceived as a way to showcase the top. And for me, I, like I said, we get it, Vince trying to appeal to investors, family, all this other stuff. But I feel like if it's a combat sport, it's going to be blood. Hell, people believe in playing basketball. You don't think people going to bleed if they're fighting each other in a ring of any sorts? It's going to be blood. It doesn't have to be gratuitous. It doesn't have to be overdone. I'm talking to you, AEW. I love the fact that y'all use blood, but y'all can tone it down because you want it to be special. You want it to be memorable. It doesn't have to be in every single match. So I do think color is needed. It just needs to be at the right moment, at the right situations, for the right matches, for the right whatever happens. You know, if I'm in a steel cage match, there should, should be there should be some blood. If I'm in a I quit match or whatever crazy stipulation match, it's a good chance there should be some blood there. It doesn't have to be crazy amounts. I get Vince trying to, you know, make money. But you can still make money and it still makes sense from a realistic or realism standpoint.
toughness and fighting skills of certain wrestlers who were considered legitimate tough guys. The tournament provided an opportunity for those wrestlers who weren't doing anything. WWF didn't have plans for them, so they decided to take 16 of the guys to compete in real fights. Wrestlers who were known for their toughness and physicality such as Bart Gunn, Bradshaw, Bob Holly, and new signing Steve Williams were amongst those who participated in the tournament. The tournament was going to be used as a platform to showcase Steve Williams, also known as Dr. Death, as a dominant force. Williams was a highly respected wrestler with a reputation for toughness and the tournament was intended to elevate his status within WWF. According to Jim Cornette, Steve Williams was the WWF favourite to win the tournament because he was a legit tough guy. The company was looking towards a lucrative pay-per-view match between Williams and Steve Austin. After having one dark match, Dr. Death Steve Williams was set to make his WWF television debut during the Brawl for All. He got by Pierre Carl Houlet in the first round before running into the unexpected buzzsaw that was former mid-card tag team wrestler Bart Gunn in the second round. Bob Holly claimed that Williams had already been paid the $100,000 prize money before his fight against Bart Gunn. During the third round of the fight, Gunn took Williams down, injuring Williams' hamstring and knocked Williams out seconds Damn. later. Gunn's victory was seen as a problem by WWF management because it went against their plans. Gunn ended up winning the tournament in the finals against Bradshaw, Jeez. but Gunn's victory over favoured competitor Steve Williams and subsequent success in the tournament went against the scripted outcome that the WWF had envisioned. As a result, WWF management reportedly viewed Gunn's win as problematic because it deviated from their plans and potentially undermined the credibility of other wrestlers. To address this issue and punish Gunn for his unexpected victory, WWE booked him in a shoot fight against professional uh -huh. boxer Butterbean at WrestleMania 15. Butterbean quickly knocked out Gunn in a matter of seconds, effectively ending his push and any momentum he had gained from That's the Warpool tournament. Jim Cornette was critical of Gunn being placed in a match with a pro boxer. Bob Holly claimed that Gunn's inevitable loss to Butterbean was a punishment for defeating the company's desired winner, yep. Steve That's Williams. He was, was also fired by the WWF afterwards. There you go. On June 7, 2020, 2010, WWE presented a special edition of Monday Night Raw known as the Viewer's Choice episode. During this episode, the main event featured a match between John Cena and CM Punk. However, this match was interrupted by the shocking debut of the Nexus, a faction consisting of NXT rookies oh, led by Ray Barrett. The Nexus made their presence about. felt by launching a brutal assault on Cena, Punk, and other WWE personnel at ringside. The attack culminated in the destruction of the ring itself and surrounding equipment, causing the match to end in a no contest. During the attack, yep. Daniel Bryan infamously <laughs> choked ring announcer. Justin Roberts with his own necktie <laughs> as part of the chaotic assault. This incident, along with Brian's act of spitting in Cena's face, garnered significant attention and controversy due to its perceived violence. WWE reportedly felt that these acts mm -hmm. were too extreme for their TV PG programming and could potentially cause issues with sponsors. Consequently, Daniel Bryan was released from his WWE contract on June 11, 2010. On the June 14, 2010 edition of Raw, Wade Barrett, the leader of Nexus, explained Brian's absence by stating that Brian had shown remorse for his actions, leading to his expulsion from the group. You will never ever see Daniel Bryan here again. Another incident involving Daniel Bryan. Which is crazy when you think about it because he became arguably one of the biggest stars in WWE. <laughs> came on the May 1st, 2018 episode of SmackDown Live. After delivering a big boot to the Daniel Bryan impersonator, Big Cass was supposed to leave the ring as instructed. However, he reportedly requested permission to continue beating up the impersonator, which was initially denied. Despite this denial, he proceeded to carry out the additional beatdown anyway, which reportedly angered WWE oh. officials, including Vince McMahon himself. This incident contributed to WWE's decision to book Big Cass to lose twice via submission to Daniel Bryan in subsequent matches. This, coupled with other reported personal conduct issues, likely contributed to WWE's decision to release Big Cass from his contract. Now, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out our similar videos. That's, that's kind of, that's on him. If you want to be honest, like, hey, they, hey, they say don't do it, don't do it. You, that kind of got to listen. You know what I'm saying? He just went and did it his own way and look what happened so hey man this is this was a very informative video some of these i've seen you know before and some of them i haven't seen before so y'all comment down below let me know some other situations where you know wrestlers got punished for going off script if you were you know if you've seen it live or you heard about it online but i appreciate all love support y'all have shown on the channel road to 150k and i'm still getting speedy youtube wrestling champ of the world appreciate y'all kicking it with me see you on the next one peace